There are so many reasons not to skip breakfast. So many savory, mouth-watering, tasty, delicious beyond all belief reasons. Actually, that last one was pretty convincing. Stop by for a McDonald's breakfast. Mix and match a sausage biscuit, sausage McMuffin, sausage burrito, or hash browns. Any two for just two bucks. Price and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with combo meal. New hot and iced sunrise batch coffee from Dunkin'. A bright and balanced, full-bodied blend, brewed so you can get summering from sunrise to sunset. And even after that, because that's when you can show off those string lights you hung in the backyard. Or re-hung. Enjoy a medium, hotter, iced sunrise batch coffee for $2. America runs on Dunkin'. Price and participation may vary. Limited time offer. Exclusions apply. Got a hand on the door, never know where it might lead. No screwed up before, but now I'm thinking what it might be. When you're up on the side, yeah, I don't ever have to worry. Welcome to the Deconstructionist Podcast. I am your host, John Williamson, and I've got a great guest for you today, but first, a few things. If you are new to the podcast, welcome and thank you for listening. We're really glad that you're here. If you want to stay up to date on all of the latest, uh, check out our website, www.thedeconstructionist.com. You can find our blog there, our entire catalog of episodes from the past five years, links to our social media, links to our web store where we have t-shirts, pint glasses, and coffee mugs available, and a link to our Patreon if you would like to support us there. Also, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss a future episode of our show. And if you have time, consider leaving us a five-star review on iTunes or telling a friend about the show. With that out of the way, this week's guest is Trey Pearson. Trey is best known as the lead singer of the popular band Everyday Sunday and his work as a solo artist. In 2016, Trey publicly came out as a gay man in an interview with the Ohio-based magazine 614. This news quickly reached all of the media outlets, including The View, where Trey was interviewed about what it was like to come out privately and publicly and ultimately accepting his sexuality. As a podcast, we've never covered this topic before. And as you'll notice over the next month, I don't spend much, if any time, digging into the so-called clobber verses in the Bible. There are plenty of resources available that address those verses, and I'll put some of those in the show notes. My interest was to have a conversation with someone who went through something I could never imagine as a heterosexual person, to allow Trey and others to tell their story so that we can better understand the human aspect. The fact that while we spend time arguing over vague references in the Bible, and if Paul really meant what he said, there's a real person, a real human being, crying out to be loved the way Jesus tried to teach us. No matter which side of the debate you find yourself on, I implore you to engage in the selfless, agendaless type of love that Jesus talks about in the Gospels. With that being said, over the next month, we'll explore two very different journeys to try to gain a little perspective. I hope these episodes serve as a way to open up some loving dialogue and to challenge all of us to be more inclusive, more loving, and more expansive in our outpouring of love, because at the end of the day, no matter who you are, We are all God's children. So join me for the first episode as I have a wonderful conversation with Trey, who also happens to be from Columbus, Ohio. So it was really nice to be able to do this one in person. Uh, We had a great chat and got to bond over our mutual love of one of our fine local breweries, Land Grant Brewing. The special music was also provided by Trey. So if you dig what you hear, go out and support Trey's work. And you can find links to that in the show notes. So without further ado... I give you Trey freaking Pearson. Maybe tonight we'll find out. Don't want to leave, can't get enough. The city's got a million lights. And I never believed before now. Maybe tonight we'll find out. Don't want to leave, can't get enough. I know the love is love. I know the love is love. I know the love is love. 
welcome to the podcast. I'm super excited, uh, first of all, because I never get to do these in person. Second of all, this is long overdue. Trey, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. Well, this is this is a topic that we have not uh, covered uh, up until this point, and I think you just have such a cool story. Uh, Cool, cool. Maybe not the best word. <laughs> Let me retract that. Love when your life hit the fan. That was great. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. When your life went up in flames, that was really cool. No, um, no. Thank you. I think your story. I think your story uh, is is fascinating in, in the sense that uh, not only were you a musician who is kind of in the the public consciousness, but a Christian musician per se. Quote. Yeah. Air quotes. So uh, before we get into that, though, I, I think uh, let's start. At the very, very beginning, uh, when you were raised, were you raised in a particularly Christian household? Like, what was your upbringing like? Yeah, yeah. I was raised in a very conservative uh, Christian home. My parents, they went and still go to a small, non-denominational Calvinist uh, church in West Jeff, which is West Jefferson, which is like a small town right outside the city. And that's the small town I grew up in. Uh, So, uh, you know, I definitely grew up being taught all the things where Jesus loves us, God loves us, uh, Jesus loves all the little children of the world until you're like 12 and you find out, oh, well, God only loves some of the cho- the chosen ones. <laughs> right. And everyone else is like a child of the devil and going to burn in hell for eternity. <laughs> uh, so that's that's the world I grew up in. And I definitely uh, loved my faith as a kid. I was super into wanting to understand how, you know, how my life was and and what God wanted for me. And so, like, I fell in love with the heroes of the Bible as a kid. Um, as a teenager, I got involved in a more uh, evangelical... So, my parents were con- Calvinists for anyone who doesn't know what Calvinist is. It's, like, where they believe you're predestined and chosen before time, I guess. And your, your name's written in the Lamb's book of life. (laughs) And, and so if you ever come to believe in Jesus as your savior, it's because God picked you. And if you don't, it's because you were born a child of the devil and you were not chosen to spend eternity in heaven. And that is a crazy fucked up thing to (laughs) teach a kid. Uh, Yes. And and you desperately as a child want to be one of the chosen ones, right? You don't want to burn for eternity in hell. (laughs) And then, uh, and then with, you know, with that said, I also grew up being taught things like it's an abomination to be gay. And, um, so I definitely didn't want to be that. And so, uh, probably about 14, this guy moved to my school in West Jefferson who, um, started this Bible study group for the high school. And, I was like a young freshman, so I was 13 turning 14 my freshman year of high school, and this guy drove, and he was only a grade above me, but he he was 16 and had a license, and I'm 14, and I'm like, all right, cool, yeah, and so he would take me around and took started taking me to his youth group at this mega church, uh, which was more evangelical, like believed in free will, which was progressive for me. <laughs> and I thought, oh, wow, this is interesting. And I was scared of some of those beliefs because I wanted to believe my parents were right and my parents' church was right and everything I grew up, I didn't want even that to be shaken, right? And so that was an interesting dynamic. But all of a sudden I found so much excitement to be in this youth group with hundreds of kids where – they all like love Jesus and um, were Christians, and that gave me a place of acceptance and community. And so, I think as somebody who grew up with parents who worked in the city in Columbus, which is a lot bigger than for for a lot of you that listening that aren't from Columbus, it's a lot bigger city than you might imagine. <laughs> um, I like to brag that we are now the 14th biggest city in the country. It's true. Yeah. It's true. We're bigger but, than Boston, and no one would 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 assume that to be yeah, true. Yeah. So my parents both worked in the city. I grew up doing theater downtown Columbus, uh, starting when I was like 11 or 12. And I, 
I think I was really at this impasse at 14 where uh, I was trying to figure out how to be a good Christian, but also like I had a lot of questions because I'm starting to meet gay people at theater, gay adults, and 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 people that think differently, and um, kids that grew up in Jewish families, and like in the small town I lived in outside the city, that was different and scary, and I was like, whoa. So they're not chosen, <laughs> like that, like that, that kind of thing. And so I end up kind of finding this safe place at this mega church youth group, and that's where I found out about Christian rock music. And and so I had this youth pastor who I loved and very influential in my life, but you know it was very much this kind of um, fundamentalist ideology still, even though it was slightly different than my Calvinist upbringing. Uh, and they believed in this crazy edgy thing called free will. <laughs> Whoa. Um, they, uh, you know, it's still like, oh, well, we, we know that the Bible says Jesus' first miracle was to turn water into wine, but, you know, it's a sin to drink, <laughs> just so you know. And uh, don't <laughs> smoke, don't cuss, don't do anything that uh, we say is a sin. And so... I was very influenced by that, but also I'm finding out about all this Christian rock music and I get invited to go to these Christian rock concerts. And I had known a little bit about Christian music growing up. Like my mom liked Amy Grant and Michael W. Smith, and that's literally (laughs) all I knew. And, um, oh, my oldest sister, so I'm the youngest of three. My oldest sister, about like maybe right before that time, her friend gave her a DC talk cassette tape uh, called free at last. And she thought it was weird because it was super Jesus-y. And so she gave it to me. (laughs) And so I'd listen to it. I'd play basketball out in the driveway. And, um, and that was my introduction to Christian music. And then, so I get in this youth group and I'm going to like Christian rock concerts and DC talks coming out with Jesus freak. And I find out about MXPX and some kind of cool edgy bands that not every song was about God or Jesus. And there was like room for, metaphors and things that might be about life, uh, other things, but like, you know, you could still be a Christian. And so I thought that was cool. And I kind of had taught myself how to play chords on piano growing up. And I loved performing on stage from the theater aspect. And so I thought, oh, well, there's these kids in the youth group that like write songs and play them for the youth group. I could do that. And so I started writing songs and I thought, well, I know all these kids in the, on the yeah, sorry if this is triggering for some people, but like on the praise team <laughs> or whatever. And uh, I was like, so I decided I put my own band together. And as I was turning 16, I called it Everyday Sunday. And I kind of went from this dream as a teenager who is like on Nerf boxes and doing commercials and Ford commercials and Steak and Shake and all uh, Pringles ads and all like doing theater downtown to like I thought I was going to become this actor and then all of a sudden I was like, ooh, I think I want to just like be in a Christian rock band. Nobody told me how not lucrative that was, <laughs> uh, but but I really pursued that dream and so I went to college my freshman. Me- freshman year at Indiana Wesleyan University and by um by the end of my freshman year I was kind of like I knew all I wanted to do was plan a band and go tour and so I really pursued making a full-length independent album and within a few months after that got a record deal and signed to a major Christian label in Nashville and uh And so that's like kind of the, oh, well, there's a whole lot to say behind that uh, childhood. I don't know how much you want me to say right now, but, you you know, uh, within that time, you know, sometime in adolescence, I'm realizing that uh, I didn't want to admit it to myself, but I definitely was finding myself sexually attracted to boys and not girls. And I felt like that was a temptation from the devil because that wasn't natural. That was an abomination. God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, all those things. And so that was really difficult, but I just pushed that down and I convinced myself, you know what? God's will, you know, I know I want to be a dad one day and a husband. And I, I definitely had those romantic notions of love. And I wanted to know what it was like to fall in love with a girl. And so, uh, I had girlfriends like I, you know, my first quote unquote girlfriend was eighth grade and she broke up with me cause I wouldn't kiss her. <laughs> and then, uh, um, you know, probably didn't have a actual, like, I guess girlfriend and again until my senior year of high school. 
and this girl from my youth group, great girl. We had a lot of fun together, and I thought, oh, I could maybe see myself having a family with this person, sure. And so she was my girlfriend, and uh, you know, I think by our freshman year of college, she probably saw things like marriage, and I didn't, and so we broke up, and then uh, I dated one other girl early in my touring years, and a uh, similar thing. I didn't want to make out with her. The most we ever did was a pet kiss goodnight. And, um, and you know, also growing up in sexual purity culture, along with growing up in a culture mm. that teaches you it's not okay to be gay, and that's not a, that it is a choice, and that it's not natural. Uh, it was easy to not want to have sex. And I was like, oh, yeah, no, we should not do that, and we shouldn't do anything that leads to that. And so uh, staying pure was a lot easier for me than it was for any of my friends. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I all of a sudden am touring in this, like, Christian rock band and getting to tour all around the world with these bands I grew up listening to and – um, getting radio play and very interesting thing because I'm finally like fulfilling this thing that I dreamed of doing. And, um, during that time, there was this girl that also grew up in the church that I did, the, the mega church once, you know, she grew up in that church and, uh, she, was home from her freshman year of college. I was home from tour uh, for Christmas, and we were all hanging out at this uh, lady's house from our church. And I was just thinking, like, man, why can't I? I meet a girl like her. She's great. We have fun. We laugh. Like, wait, does this mean I like her? Like, you know, like I need to meet a girl like her. And um, for anyone that has any gay friends at all, it's pretty normal for a gay guy to have a girl best friend. That does not mean you should marry them. And it uh, does not mean that you're sexually attracted to them. But I very much wanted to uh, – when you don't have anything to base it off of, you're like, okay, well, what is love supposed to look like? What is intimacy supposed to look like? I'm not supposed to have sex till I'm married, so – all these things I was struggling with, all these internal demons that I felt like I had for having sexual feelings towards guys, I couldn't admit that to anyone, let alone the girl I was dating. And and I just thought, well, if I just honor God with this and I save sex till marriage and do it, then God's going to bless me and honor me and um, it's all going to work out great. And so I put all my faith into that. And so I... I did. I I didn't even make out with a girl until I got married, and then all of a sudden, you know, wedding night comes uh, that week, and uh, it was major failure for me. And I felt so ashamed and embarrassed, but I also thought, is that you know, I felt guilty, like I had done something wrong because I had thought about guys so long of my life, and I thought, well, I just need to fix it, and so. Um, yeah, that's kind of the journey my life took because, you know, I'd grown up in a world that taught me to just put all my faith into believing these things are true. And if I do, then God will honor me and bless me with it. And so, and so that's what I did. And that's where I found myself. I ended up, you know, touring around the world in a Christian rock band and getting married to a girl. And, uh, yeah. Wow. So... So I, I can only imagine it's it's probably a lot of pressure as it is because I, I mean we were talking before the podcast we're both roughly the same age and I, I know for me I can recall um, the first like same sex kiss on TV you know on the Ellen Show <laughs> yeah, right? yeah. and that was such a huge deal which oh, seems yeah, hilarious my dad now was so angry <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure he wasn't the only one right but You're right. But like it, it seems so silly now because you know there there are uh, young adult shows now. I mean, I was watching one the other day on Netflix. You know where there's a there's a lesbian couple on there, and it's like no big deal. Sure. Um, but like growing up when we did, I can only imagine the immense amount of pressure to begin with because it was such a taboo thing. Yeah. And then you add this this because we also grew up during purity culture, like you mentioned. So you have this added pressure uh, to conform on top of that. Um, and it was interesting. We've done an, actually an episode on purity culture. There's a great book out there called Pure, but I'd never considered the impact on you know on guys from from the perspective of somebody who's attracted to other guys. Yeah. So like so so talk about like 
uh, how that negatively impact. I mean, you started, I think you started going down that road, but like the pressure that you probably placed on yourself as well. But like, so you're, you're, you you were married for how long? Uh, well, I ended up staying married for seven and a half years before everything kind of hit the fan. So, yeah. so how did you, how did you kind of maintain that? Was it a situation where you just tried to stay busy and stay on the road or like, yeah, what were some I, of the I think it was pressures? a combination of things, you know, um, Obviously, I felt a lot of shame and uh, and definitely denial um, where it was like I thought, well, I just have to do whatever it takes to make this work and go well because I committed my life to this person in front of my family, my friends, my church, you know, and um, and so I I guess – for me, it was like always justifying it. Like, well, maybe like, you know, if we didn't argue as much or if this didn't happen and, and uh, you know, maybe then things in the bedroom could be a lot better. Right. And, uh, you know, seven months into our marriage, she got pregnant, even though she was on, um, birth control and it's not like that stuff was happening a lot. And so it was like, you know, it was just got into easy routes where I was always thinking, well, if this was different, then maybe it could get better. And God, please help me to stop like thinking about guys as much. And then I'll be able to have less trouble with this. And so, um, yeah, I feel like it was always something, you know, in my mind where I was trying to figure out, well, it's not, not because I'm gay. Cause I'm not gay. And you know, like I wanted to convince myself of that. And, you know, I don't, I don't know. At some point I, you know, to go into a lot more detail, like, you know, as a kid, my uncle was married to a woman. He had two kids, grew up in the same town as I was. And it was like my mom's brother. And all of a sudden I'm like 12 and he's dying of AIDS. And it's a taboo thing to talk about why that happened. And so, you know, like there's all these things where like, um, all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, well, you know, realizing my own struggles in my marriage, still like s- separating things, um, compartmentalizing. I was like, oh, well, maybe like Uncle Jeff was just gay, you know? And, uh, and I think slowly, like, you know, I'm also touring around the world in this band, and I do think, you know, traveling and seeing different ways other people believe, especially like we were very lucky where we got to tour all 50 states and 20 countries and kind of all over where, you know, you're seeing different cultures and you're seeing maybe not everybody thinks the exact same way you did growing up. And, you know, there's people like Rob Bell coming into my life who, you know, became my favorite author and I got to meet him during my touring years and he became a mentor of mine. And, you know, all of a sudden, like all these things that I had put all my faith into growing up, I'm starting to allow myself to question. And, and so it's, it's during this time of being married where I'm slowly processing how I even see the Bible, how I even see God or my faith. And, um, and eventually I remember getting the point during my marriage where I was like, I don't know that I'm a hundred percent sure it's a sin to be gay. (laughs) And that was like a huge thing for me. And, um, that followed shortly after coming to a place in my deconstruction of saying, I'm not a hundred percent sure. I think God wrote every word of the Bible and that it's (laughs) inerrant and infallible and all these words we've come up with for it. And Though, but those were like major, like life shaking things for me that I had never been able to face before. And so, um, I'm facing those things while I'm married, while I'm having, you know, two beautiful kids. And, um, that was a very tough thing to, uh, kind of come to terms with, I guess. And so once I even was able to come to terms with the fact that I didn't think it was a sin for other people to be gay, I felt so um, mm, committed in my in my own marriage and my own life as a dad and a husband that I couldn't even allow myself to go there mentally for it to be an option for myself. And that was just 
another level I was going to have to get to. And so, yeah, it was definitely a lot of denial through that whole thing, but I was, I was paralyzed emotionally. And, um, you know, when you grow up being brainwashed to believe that there's something wrong with you, if you're gay, that you're an abomination, that God will, um, hate you. Uh, that's, that's a, that really, uh, fucks with your brain. Like it really makes you think, I have to do whatever I have to do not to be that. And, um, and when that is the way you grow up, it really leads you to make a lot of pretty messed up decisions. And, uh, and I think that's kind of where I found myself in that time. And even though I was, did feel like I was growing and progressing in my faith, um, I still didn't feel like it was an option for me until, you know, I think, you know, coming to this place seven and a half years in where we were in a situation or even just our own failures and our intimacy of our marriage, uh, we were not able to talk about those things. And um, finally, for the first time, we're seriously having this conversation of my wife asking me, "Are you gay?" And are you know? And and we we were, we were just in such a terrible state that I thought, well, I could say no and push this down even further and make things worse than they already are. I could say yes, but I can't say yes. I've I've never I can't even I hadn't even been able to admit to myself at this point that I'm gay. And then um and all I knew how to say in that moment was I don't know, but I think I need to get help. And uh mm. and so I reached out to an affirming pastor friend of mine and just kind of started sharing all these things I'd felt since I was a kid and you know like I said, as a kid, I was in love with the Bible, and to be honest, I was I was kind of a Bible nerd as a teenager. I I read through the Bible as a teen six times, front to back. I memorized the Book of James. I was in Bible Bowl. We had buzzers. Whoa! <laughs> and you know, as a as a teenager trying to understand, honestly, like subconsciously, maybe why I had some of the feelings I did, like towards other guys and wanting to be close to other guys. I didn't want to think of it as gay and I wanted to understand why I felt the way I did. And I fell in love with the story in the Hebrew scriptures uh, with David after he slays Goliath and he moves in with the king. And, uh, you know, shortly after that, at the you know, it, so the whole David and Goliath story is in First Samuel 17, uh, chapter 17. And, and then at the beginning of chapter 18, uh, it says he didn't go back to his family, but he moved in with the king's family. And like in the first three verses of First Samuel 18, uh, David fought, like, you know, basically it says he became, I, I don't want to say falls in love, I don't know, but he <laughs> became one in spirit with the king's son, Jonathan. And it talks about them making these oaths, uh, uh, to each other and how they loved each other as themselves. And for that next three chapters, it talks about this intimate relationship between David and Jonathan. And and then it even goes on to say later where David says that Jonathan's love was greater than women. And I thought, oh, okay, well, like, that doesn't mean they were gay. And if 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 they can experience that kind of intimacy with other, uh, with as men, then maybe that's just what I desire instead of being gay. And so I think I was always on the search to try and find this intimacy with other men, like a David and Jonathan type relationship. And I thought if I could find that, that would mean I wasn't gay. And so, um, you know, I'd had all these feelings since I was a kid. And I started explaining this to this like affirming pastor friend of mine. And after an I don't know, an hour, hour and a half of talking to him for the first time in my life, I said, I think I might be gay. And I just started bawling and bawling. And um, I think all this stuff that I'd been pushing down uh, for the first 35 years of my life, I, you know, came gushing up. And uh, and that kind of led me in the process to finally accepting myself. He got me with a therapist friend of his. And uh, eventually, my former wife and I started talking to this therapist separately and then together. And I finally came out of the closet to myself and then to her and my family. And yeah, that was, uh, I was extremely difficult, extremely painful. And this thing that I, I mean, looking back, I didn't think I would ever face. And all of a sudden, you know, my whole world is falling apart. And, um, 
you know, I don't think anybody ever gets into a marriage thinking that they want it to end one day, right? <laughs> and, uh, um, yeah, that was kind of like a very scary thing when all of a sudden you you have no idea what life is about to look like, but all you know is you can't do it the way you were doing it anymore. And, um, and all I knew at that point was I just needed to be honest with myself. I just could st- – I had to stop lying to myself because I wasn't trying to lie to other people. I was always trying to be honest and vulnerable. But, you know, when there's this huge part of yourself that you are unable to be honest and vulnerable about, even with yourself, then you're not going to be able to do that with other people. And that's where I found myself. And that was extremely hard. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. I look back now and I, I just think like, man, this this thing I thought I would be enslaved to. I thought it'd be, it was like my thorn in the flesh, right? You know, uh, for all you kids that grew up super Christians, like Paul had his thorn in the flesh. I thought, well, mine must be this temptation from the devil to like other guys. And I thought like, there's no way um, this could be a blessing from God. And, you know, I, I guess with the whole idea of like the fact that I was deconstructing my faith and really really had been changing in perspective. I do think um, when I did finally come to accept myself, I didn't think it was a sin anymore. And so I wasn't dealing with that shame anymore. It was more just like, one, just the excruciating pain that I was hurting my wife and putting her through the pain that I was. And then also just that um, that I'd gone all this much of my life without being able to be honest with myself. And, and so, you know, I found myself for months on end. Uh, I, I swear to you for like three months, there probably wasn't five days that I didn't completely ball my eyes out crying and, um, just allowing myself to grieve and, uh, feel all those things. And, uh, and so, yeah, so now, um, you know, I, I'm at this place where I'm kind of hanging up my old Christian rock band every day Sunday and saying, I don't want to do that anymore. And also realizing I don't want to like, uh, you know, one thing that, you know, coming into the Christian industry at such a young age at 21 and feeling like, uh, you have to know everything about everything and be this like super Christian and wanting to be too. And like feeling like you're leading these people all at all these concerts playing for millions of people, um, getting on the radio, being heard by millions of people, uh, feeling like you're in this position, uh, where you're influencing so many people and you want to be honest and vulnerable with your music, but you're also this kid who kind of doesn't know shit and, but you're like (laughs) trying to know shit and then you're evolving and growing as you're playing these concerts and getting songs on radio. And all of a sudden you find yourself not thinking the same things you did, you know, seven years before that or, or whatever it is. And, um, and one thing I hated when I came into the industry is how much stuff was hidden behind closed doors in the Christian music industry. And I, so when I came out, I knew I, it was not this thing I wanted to hide about myself or feel ashamed about myself or tuck my tail between my legs and um, be like, oh, yeah, I can't believe I did that. You know, and I thought, you know what? No, I grew up in this system, this oppressive system that damages countless LGBTQ lives. And I know how much my life was damaged growing up in this system. And I want to do everything I can to tell my story and use it in a way that I hope will will change, will make, have an impact on people and help. You know, if this helps save anyone from going through the hell that I went through, then I want to be able to do that. And um, I wanted to do that for myself. I wanted to do that for every closeted LGBTQ person out there. Um, And I wanted to do it for my kids who are going to grow up and totally know what their parents went through one day. And I I wanted them to see their dad did it well. And uh, I tried my best. And, And so I had all these things going through my head, but I knew that I... You know, I have all these fans. I do music. My life's falling apart. Uh, I'm not going to be welcome in these Christian music circles anymore. But I knew that I wanted to, uh, you know, tell my story in a way that I thought hopefully one would help other people out there that struggled in in that 
world and um also hopefully in a way that that made a difference uh where my yeah where my kids could be proud of me one day and so um and honestly i just it felt so freeing to be vulnerable and to and to tell my truth on my own terms because i did find quickly there were other other people that were trying to tell my story for me that wanted me to keep my tail between my legs and stay ashamed of who i was and mm. i was not allowed about to let those people tell my story on their terms i i wanted to do it on my own and so so i did i came out publicly and you know, I knew people would talk about it. I don't think um, there's any way I could have realized how talked about it was. But, you know, I came out on the cover of 614 Magazine here in Columbus. Oh, and yeah. uh, by that afternoon, it was the number one trending topic in the world on Facebook. And I'm getting calls from the New York Times, CNN, uh, Whoa. Billboard Magazine, uh, everywhere, uh, Washington Post, uh, everything. It, it just didn't stop. And and so, you know, within a few days, I was flying to New York to be on The View. And uh, I was like, oh, you know, I, I knew, pe- you know, when you've played thousands of shows and, and, and you've been in this world, I knew people would talk about it. But I, I, I did not realize, I guess, how talked about it it would become. And uh, But I, I was thankful for that. And I was thankful that it was reaching all kinds of queer kids that were reaching out to me on social media and telling me uh, how much my story was impacting them. And that really meant a lot to me. And um, I know there's still people that are mad that I told my story on my own terms and uh, people that would have liked me not to do it that way but I would never change it. I uh, am really thankful for how many lives it got to touch and continues to touch. And, uh, and, and I, do, I do think in a lot of ways it was probably therapeutic for myself as well. Because I know that I could never change. I tried so hard, brought so much pain. And I just want to be loved for who I am. I know that I could never change I tried so hard and brought so much pain And I just want to be loved for who I am I Yeah, I think, I think one of the biggest things too here is that um, you know, relationships in and of themselves are very complicated and complex and can, can be messy. You know, it's part of being alive as part of being a human is the fact that we are communal and, and relational and that, and all that. Um, but not only do you have to kind of go through this process on your own, but then also have to go through it with your wife at the time. But yeah. then in your situation, whereas for most people that would be kind of a private thing, yeah, yours becomes a very public thing. Yeah. And so then you have to go through it kind of out there in front of almost like millions of people. Yeah. And I think like, um, and that, that was probably extremely difficult on my wife as well. Um, being married to somebody who's already like kind of a public figure because like I have these number one hits in Christian music world where it feels like this weird bubble subculture thing, but, uh, I have this following and all of a sudden, um, our life is being torn open in front of the world. Right. And, um, I do understand why that's tough. Uh, I also real have come to realize, and 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 over these years, and continue continued to affirm that um, it's because we share our stories that the world gets better and that the world changes, uh, especially in the LGBTQ community to know why we've come as far as we have on LGBTQ rights and LGBTQ acceptance. It's because people chose to share their stories and their journeys, and it's not easy. And um, there's a lot of pain that comes within those stories, and I still know it was the right thing to do. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's, it's a tough thing. I, I remember when I first encountered your story, I, I remember um, – reading about it. Unfortunately, it wasn't in the 614. I wish it had been because it's great publication <laughs> and represent. Oh, uh, before we go on, we should probably mention our, our beer sponsor here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we're, uh, we're enjoying, um, this wonderful blessing from land grant brewery mm-hmm. who provided us with beers for this podcast and, uh, conversation. And, uh, 
We love Land Grant. Uh, Tom, one of the guys there, is such a, a wonderful supporter, and he decided he wanted to uh, to share these with us. So I'm sure uh, as you introduce this episode, you can always throw something out there as well. But uh, yeah. we do want to just say thank you to those guys. So we're uh, just pouring them here and enjoying <laughs> ourselves. But, uh, but yeah, Land Grant Brewery is the shit. Uh, if you're from the Amazing. Columbus area, check it out. If you're ever in Columbus, check it out, or just get online and check them out because uh, I do love their beer. And so we're trying their new uh, IPA, Oh Sure, oh, that sure. just came out, which is great. <laughs> and I'm so also funny. trying this hazy IPA, Zacharyo. I don't know, but they've got great cover art too. Oh I yeah, that. I like it. So anyway, yeah. Um, yeah, I just happened to look over and I'm like, oh hey, because <laughs> I, I know I'll forget. Um, so yeah, we're both from. Columbus, I was going to get there city. when I I came to the point in my life where I finally became okay with drinking <laughs> because you know I, we were talking about this before we started recording the podcast, but I uh, I ruined a beautiful transition. <laughs> I know it's it's all good. I uh, I you know growing up finding out about Christian music as a teenager, getting so influenced by this Christian music world, but also like kind of growing up in this fundamentalism where it wasn't okay to drink or even say like, you know, quote unquote bad words. Uh, <laughs> I, I was very much living, even as I started touring in this Christian rock band, uh, in this kind of naive world where I was still very fundamentalist and didn't drink. And all of a sudden, as I'm progressing in my own journey and starting to go, man, like, am I sure like this Jesus who turned water into wine, like, uh, that, that I believe in this, you know, this is like the first miracle written about in, you know, uh, the book of John or gospel of John or whatever. Uh, am I sure that this guy's like totally against like drinking, <laughs> you know? And, and then all of a sudden you're also, not supposed to do it in public as a Christian rock musician. And so, like, if you do do it, you do it behind closed doors. And you're like, well, this seems kind of false. And um, I never wanted to be that person either. But then all of a sudden you're changing in your ideology. And people make it such a big deal in that world uh, to change what you might think about something. And it's like, oh, well, if you do change what you think, just make sure you, nobody knows about it. Right. right. <laughs> Right, <laughs> and, which is such a, a a great sign of a toxic environment <laughs> and a, a toxic world to be living in. That you should think, oh, if you really feel something is true, you should you should make sure you hide that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and that was about like whether whether you thought it was a sin to be gay or whether you what you believed about hell or you know drinking alcohol or saying the word shit, you know, like, <laughs> right, yeah. um, but those are all like real things I'm dealing with as a, an adult in my twenties touring around the world as a Christian rock band. Right. And so <laughs> that is a uh, weird thing, but yeah, I, uh, I came to a place where I thought, you know what? Um, I really, uh, love a good beer <laughs> and I don't want to be ashamed to say that. <laughs> and and in Columbus, we're surrounded by too many good microbreweries. So yes. yeah. it's almost a sin not to partake, mm. I, I think. So like one of the things that, that I'm always interested in is, is the, the human as aspect to the story. And so, you know, I remember, uh, talking to a couple other guests just in terms of like, you know, when the story first hit, what was the reaction, um, you know, was it, did you find it was supportive? Like in, in, and not only your, your community here, but like at large, um, from, from your fan base and that sort of thing, like what what kind of reaction did you experience? Yeah. Yeah. That's a good question. I think I was so nervous to, for this to come out publicly, but I also knew that I had to do it. And I, I think even choosing to do it through 614 magazine, which is just a Columbus magazine, and it's a, a pretty popular one here in Columbus, but mm -hmm. I knew it wasn't like some national publication. But I think my only thought was I trust <clears throat> this guy who wants to tell my story or help me tell my story, and um, I was just hoping I would get a little love poured out to drown out some of the hate because six years before I came out, Jennifer Knapp came out, and she had mm -hmm. been out of the industry for a long time, so it was a little bit of a different situation, but... <clears throat> Um, I remember how much flack she got and how much hate she got. And um, so I was very nervous. Like I knew some people would talk about it, but I wasn't like trying to make it this like 
worldwide story that it became. And what was surprising to me was that how much love I got poured out on me that really drowned out any of the hate that would come in. And yes, I got a lot of hate and there was a lot of horrible things said about me. Uh, but I will say that like online, whenever you saw somebody saying something terrible about me, there was a lot of other people ready to say, Hey, that's not cool. And it, it did tell me how much the world, maybe not it's not cha- changing fast enough, but like even from when Jennifer Knapp came out to when I came out, um, gave me a little hope that maybe the world is changing a little for the better. And so I was very thankful for that. And it, it was, yeah, very fascinating to see like how I talked about it. It was because I think it's important to talk about. And, you know, all these things in this Christian subculture that we try to keep taboo, um, so many p- people saying, we don't want this to be a taboo subject anymore. And uh, I was very grateful for that. So I, yeah, I think that's I think that is interesting, and I think you and I were talking about this before we started recording. Um, what what kind of change that we see, and it seems like um, you know we were talking about earlier that it's kind of shifted within the the religious communities from kind of this idea that like homosexuality is uh, some sort of choice, you know, as if like you would choose to be uh, alienated and, and right. you know, and, you know, shamed and all these things. Yeah. Um, but it seems like they've kind of moved on from that. We've progressed from that to, okay, it's not a choice. It is the way you, you're born, but you just can't act on those, on those, uh, those feelings, those, um, you know, you, you know what I mean? Yeah. So like, it, over the the five, you said five, I think it was five years, right? Since you since you publicly announced it, yeah, well, almost not quite, but yeah, yeah. So like, ha- have things changed? Have things progressed? Um, you know, do you think? Because obviously, since that time, we've seen at least within the kind of traditional church structure, you know, we've seen within the Methodist Church, Lutheran Church, a lot of those branches of those expressions of Christianity um, have taken a stance either one hmm. way or the other. Yeah. So what's your, what's your kind of take on how the church has evolved since, you know, the legalization of gay marriage and, and the mm. fact that more and more people <laughs> are publicly saying, Hey, this is who I am. Yeah. I think a few things. Um, I, I do think it's changing for the better. Um, maybe not in evangelical churches, unfortunately, There might be a few, but like, it's definitely, you know, mainline churches are continuing to take stances that are pro LGBTQ, uh, kind of more on the more open minded, progressive side of Christianity. And then you have the more conservative evangelical side that is shrinking, and for good reason, because, uh, you know, more and more young people, especially Gen Z, is like, we don't want anything to do with that. And, uh, and, you know, I'm probably in the camp of I'm pretty anti-fundamentalist at this point in my life. Like, you know, if you think you have everything locked down on faith and beliefs and you're right and everyone else is wrong, um, I find that to be a very toxic place to be as a human being. And it usually leads to damage. And I definitely have seen the damage firsthand as a gay man and as a kid who grew up closeted gay in that world. Um and so, yeah, I'm pro- probably sometimes on the let it burn kind of side <laughs> where it's like, you know what, uh, no kid needs to grow up in that environment. And it's it's sad because there are so many wonderful things I loved about growing up in youth group uh, world. And there were so many things about camaraderie and um, friendship and uh, kind of hope and something more in the universe and, and God and whatever you want to call it, the uni- you know, uh, I think there's so many beautiful things that can come from the mystery and, and a place like church that can be dedicated to 
taking time to embrace the mystery of life and the hope for more. And uh, I still enjoy that. And I think that's what um, what I hope to instill in my own children. But at the same time, uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, the long curve, the long arc toward justice that Martin Luther King talked about is uh, it's going to be a, a, a long arc still for evangelical churches to get there. And I mean, it, it's very similar to the way they used to act towards, you know, black and white people being separated in churches and uh, interracial marriage and slavery and women's rights and all these things, right? It's just like, it's not this hop, skip, and a bunch to... Uh, acceptance <laughs> right and and uh inclusivity and so that is a shame and it's sad but that's why I'm doing everything I can to use my voice to make a difference and help see it change and that's what I do so for for people out there who are listening who just cuz I think so often um topics like this one um you know like we when we did the um kind of uh uh the, the series that we did on different uh, religions, for example, I think so often it's a, it's a situation where we're just not educated, you know, like we just have not done the homework and have not done the research. So are there resources that were helpful for you when, when you first came out? Are there resources mm-hmm. that people can, can go to, to better educate themselves? Yeah, I think there are, but I think it starts with the way, like, you know, in the, Christian faith tradition that we come from, it starts with um, how you see faith, how you see the Bible. Like if you're still, like if you're trying to jump through hoops from a fundamentalist perspective and like, you know, what what we talked about, the six clobber passages (laughs) um, that people use against same-sex relationships or or being gay or queer or whatever. uh, If you're trying to still stay in this kind of fundamentalist perspective, I would say that you're you're just not going to to get there in a very um I don't know, convincing way. And and maybe that's like bad to say. Maybe that's not like the right way to say it. But um because I do know there are people that do those things that will talk about it from that perspective, like Matthew Vines, God and the Gay Christian and mm-hmm. and maybe some things like that. But I really I find more hope in starting with, wait, how do I see the Bible? Like, do, you know, did Jesus, like if, if you're still into like following the idea of Jesus and like, hey, I want to be a Jesus follower, I'm a Christian, um, but I'm not totally sold on all, all this fundamentalist stuff. Um, you know, I think it's good to start with the basics of like, all right, well, what was the core of what I grew up with? It was to love your neighbor and um, as yourself and to love God, right? And to and like what is it? Peter says, or uh, in one of the let, New Testament letters, like um, that all the commandments can be summed up in this one thing: to love your neighbor as yourself. And that's what it is to love God, which kind of reaffirms the words of Jesus. And uh, and like you know, I think for me, as somebody who still likes to believe in more uh, in spiritual things, and uh, I I would say that that is the core thing Jesus asked us to believe. And um, so in my faith tradition as a Christian, um, everything for me wraps around that. And, and nowhere did Jesus ever say, hey, a few hundred years from now, these guys are going to put together uh, the Bible and you have to believe God wrote every word of it or you're not a Christian. Like right. that was never like a thing <laughs> that had anything to do with the people that were following Jesus or becoming a follower of Jesus after he died. And so um, you have to say, well, where does that come from and why? And I'm sure so many people listening to this podcast have already thought about these things. That's why they're listening to the De- Deconstructionist podcast. <laughs> uh, but so so I would say for people like that, um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I really like um, 
Brandon Robertson has a book on inclusivity and and church. And uh, Adam Hamilton, who is a UMC pastor, had a great book that helped me even before I came out called Making Sense of the Bible. And uh, there's a chapter on homosexuality in in that uh, book that uh, really helped me affirm these things that I was progressing on in my own journey. I love Rob Bell's What is the Bible? I love Richard Rohr and, you know, probably so many of these people that all of you have already heard of. But, uh, you know, um, I think it's more just like uh, finding ways to say, hey, uh, it's not good enough to be in a space that is quiet about the subject or may not be like totally against it, but they're not like speaking out for injustice and speaking out for the marginalized. And I would say if you're in one of those spaces, then you're in the wrong space. Don't, I I don't think you should be supporting those spaces with your money. Uh, and that, you know, money speaks and that's what keeps churches alive. It's what keeps, uh, faith communities alive. And, um, and so, yeah, I, it even keeps the Christian music industry alive. And so I would say any of those spaces that is not, uh, not only like unsure about the topic, but like that is not like making a big deal about being pro LGBTQ, I would say are probably doing more harm to young people than good. And, um, and so, yeah, I think my big thing is just wanting to find places like human rights campaign, which is like about the equality of LGBTQ people with everyone or like glad, uh, who is, or the Trevor project, um, so many of these place spaces that are fighting for the rights of LGBTQ people and trying to keep people from dying and on losing their lives. And, um, I, I would just say that it's that big of a deal. And that's, that's kind of where we are in, in this time where, yeah, we've come a long way, but we still have a long ways to go. And, um, you know, even I have this, kind of private group on Facebook called Trey's LGBTQ Safe Space, and it's thousands of people sharing their journeys every day where you find out, hey, yeah, I realize that if you live in a big city, it might be more forward thinking, but there's still a lot of kids growing up in evangelical churches that make them feel like it's not okay to be who they are. And there's still stories every day of people uh, sharing the pain of how hard it was for them to finally accept themselves or that are still struggling to accept themselves. I mean, one of the, the glaring statistics is just the, the um, absolutely insane rate of suicides amongst uh, youth uh, who, are, who are struggling as a result of the way in which they were raised yeah. and, and the way that they were told that, yeah. you know, it, it, so, yeah. Um, and, and I think uh, to the idea of like, you know, the best resource. I, I, I still think, and we were talking about this before we started recording also, I think uh, just plain conversation with a human being yeah. who can speak from experience yeah. goes so far. And I think that's true for a lot of issues that, we, that we're struggling with right now, even in the 21st century, believe it or not. Yeah. If you don't know openly LGBTQ people, ask yourself, why not? You know, yeah. what are you doing in your life to get to know people that are marginalized that are different than you. And if you're not in those spaces, get out of the spaces you're at and go find them because there's lots of us out here. Yeah. And it's just, I think, I don't know. It it reminds me of this conversation I had. I I grew up in a very rural (laughs) area, went to a very small high school in a very small town Yeah, with a lot of white people. And uh, it, it was one of those situations where, you know, everybody kind of looked and thought, the same. And I remember after moving out of that community, moving to Columbus uh, and and meeting people and working alongside people and becoming friends with people and really loving people uh, who looked very different from me, who thought Mm. very different from me, who lived lives very different from me. I think what typically happens is you meet them and you become friends with them and you love them first. And then you find out later, oh, they're Muslim or oh, they're whatever. And by that point, it's too late. You've already you've already been introduced to the heart of the person, mm. and so then you're forced. I think I, I feel uh, it, into a situation where, okay, now I have to really examine what I thought I knew about them before I knew them. Yeah. What was the most liberating thing for me uh, as I was kind of progressing in my faith was the idea that God loves 
not only loves everyone, but like that God is not like going like to make people burn if they don't believe the right things. Like if you can just start with the framework that like, oh my gosh, that person is loved. Uh, that person is accepted just as they are. Uh, like, like when I was able to stop thinking, oh, I hope that person is saved and prayed the right prayer and thinks the right thing. <laughs> uh, once you're able to like start looking at people and going, oh, maybe they're just totally loved and, and made with love. And all I have to do is actually love them. Like, which speaks to the simplicity of the message of Jesus. <laughs> but you know, yes. uh, I think that was huge for me. So, mm. yeah. Well, um, I really appreciate you coming on today yeah. and, and coming to hang out. But um, any any last thoughts? Anything that you really want uh, to to get out there? Hmm. I don't think so. Just more, <laughs> uh, you know. I guess. Uh, huh. No, I'm I'm uh, excited. To, I'm I'm sure my song will already be out as this airs. But I uh, I'm excited to put out this new song that I'm doing called "Don't Dance," and it's kind of a uh, it's something I wrote about uh, just sort sort of all these personal feelings I had about people who couldn't accept me when I came out mm-hmm. and uh, people that wanted to demonize me and vilify me when I came out. And I wrote it with all those emotions, but also as this kind of invitation to join the party and celebrating who we are as as queer people. And and and. And I'm very excited to kind of get that out and share that. And I love that I still get to make music. And I do think that, like, for me, as somebody who pushed down such a huge part of my life for most of my life, to finally allow that to burst open and to experience the vulnerability and honesty that I've always wanted to uh give and and be uh as a songwriter it feels so great to get to um do that like feel that in my even in my songwriting now and in in my music and to feel like hey i finally get to be my most authentic self and i and i do notice that even in my songwriting and 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 the work that I get to do now. And I'm, I'm definitely very grateful for that. So yeah, I appreciate you having me on and talking to me about this. And uh, yeah, I, I feel grateful to get to, to share. So thank you. Well, thanks for coming on and, and, and being vulnerable and, and telling us your story. And um, where can people go to uh, keep up with what you're up to and, and find, you know, the work that you're involved in? Yeah, um, you can go to TreyPearson.com or I think pretty much most of my social medias are at Trey Pearson, like on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and uh, all those things. But uh, yeah, and then also yeah, on Facebook I have this group called Trey's LGBTQ Safe Space. If you are LGBTQ or an ally, you can search for it and join that. And there's thousands of us sharing our journeys, how it relates to being LGBTQ and that's a pretty neat space too. So, um, yeah, if, uh, if you're looking, just go to TreyPearson.com or look on like Spotify or Apple music or whatever, uh, YouTube, whatever, uh, streaming thing you do. And, uh, you can find me there as well. So awesome. Thank you so much, Trey. I appreciate it. Thank you. It's all around oh. I've got your back against the wall I see you just standing there You can dance if you want to, want to But don't you say that you don't dance To this song, make your mind up You're all alone, you fancy You can move your feet Don't be the only one in your street Don't say you don't dance To this song, make your mind up You're all alone, you fancy You can move your feet Here's your chance, I dare you not to You've been saying 
Maybe you thought it'd make you look better. I see you try to run from love, but you got the same demons to weather. Who you trying to fool? Cause you ain't fooling me. Who you trying to be? Cause it's how you I see. Got your back against the wall. I see you just standing there. You can dance if you want to, want to, but don't you say that. Music. If you think I'm going to head on this to my music, 